Okay, uh, two things. Today I'll be talking about the Austrian school of thought, but also I want to get the groups organised, so that's the first thing I want to talk about. Let's see if this mouse is working. No, it's not. Okay. Um, I'll put you all in groups. There's one, is it a riff here? One guy wrote to me, yeah, okay. I've got most of your group, but I've got to I'll collect that, correct that at the break. But you've all been put in groups on Canvas. So if you go to Canvas, let's hope this link works. Let's see. Okay. So you see groups here. And Group A, for example, people those are people who actually chose to be in that group. Otherwise, if you didn't choose me, give me a group last week, then I've just put you in groups by alphabetical order, or rock whatever it came up in, um, I think it was student number order, in uh, Canvas. So take a look at those groups, see which one you're in, and then during the break, if you can work out which weeks you want to uh, give a class in. Group A has already chosen week nine. I remember I told you last week, people presenting in the first three weeks get a five mark base level for their both their essay and the group presentation. So you'd be marked out of 20, you start with five, okay, to make up for the fact that it's so early. Um, and I'll just show you the weeks, that the sessions that are coming up. Let's see, pardon me, wrong slide. Okay. So what I want you to work on is you both, you all got to work on an individual essay. So, and each person is going to take one of five different schools of thought and present their perspective on one issue each week. So together you've got to put together a presentation of 40 or 50 minutes. That uh, The best way to do that is have one, you know, if you may use PowerPoint, one set of PowerPoint slides where you each hop up in sequence and then present your little your little bit. That's the fastest way to organise it. And th these are going to happen in the um, 7th and 9th and 20th and 22nd week of the year. And the five perspectives you have to cover are what I called last week the freshwater neoclassical, the very um, assume perfect competition, assume equilibrium all the time approach to neoclassical economics. Then you have the saltwater group who say, well, there's not perfect competition, therefore there's frictions and things don't converge to equilibrium quickly. The Austrian, which I'll talk about today, the post casein which I'll talk about next week, and the week after I'll be talking mainly about ecological economics. But that's the fifth group. You have to choose one of those three. Okay? And then what you've got to do, depending on the week, is present a presentation where you, where you where you provide each of those perspectives on this particular subject, highlighting how they're different. And what I want you to do as well as a group is work out which one you're most persuaded by. Okay? So that's the, the main thing. Group presentation, individual essays. So each of you who's doing, uh, this person who's doing the, uh, the saltwater neoclassical in the group will also present an essay on the saltwater neoclassical perspective on that topic, okay? And then, so that's week 7 to 20, you're going to do, should the government run a sur surplus? Weeks 8 to 21, we'll do, should you nationalise various services? Now, of course, that's become topical now because that's what Corbyn's raised as a potential after the last 30 or so years of privatising, saying should we actually have those as public? And then the different perspectives on each of those. And finally, what should be done to help tackle climate change? So Group A, who's in Group A? Anybody here in Group A? Yep, okay, you've got that one. Okay. okay. Which, 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 which did? I, I'm, I'm open, open to negotiation here because I've just allocated them that way straight away. If, you, if you've already formed a group, first ones in can say which topic they want and I'll shuffle the others around, yeah? Pardon? Sorry, speak up. Yes, you can. Okay, so I'll fix it up uh, after the in the break. Yeah. Is Group B on week nine as well? Yes, that's right. Group B. Yeah, that's so you actually. Yeah. So Group A and B. Whoops. Hang on. Just go across to the slides and change that. Okay. So Groups A and B have already chosen week nine, and then it's got to be the same topic. Okay. Yeah. So we'll do uh, the second one. Okay. So look, I'll change that around now. So we've got for week. Uh, I might. I'll make it different for week twenty-two. This is still. Um, Preliminary, but that's so you want to do the second topic? Yeah. Both of you? Yeah. Both groups? Yeah. Okay. A and B, happy with that? Okay, well, that's the case. So I'll just whack that inside there and I'll fix this up after the lecture. So at the moment, okay. By default, that's so now the other groups. Once you ch check on during during the break, about ten minutes of the break, check 
study space and see which group you're in and then choose which of the weeks and topics you want to go in. Group A and B, because they organise themselves together already, they've already got the first, first pick of those. Let's go back to the slides. Okay. Okay. Now, there's one group. Uh, we've had extra people sign up to the subject since last week, and that's meant I've now got a, I've got a group of only two. If that's the case, and there's going to be a fair bit of shuffling that will go on at some stage because some people will drop out, new people might come in like have happened in the last couple of days. Uh, so if that's the case, then I'll limit the number of topics being, not the topics being covered, but the number of schools being covered. So if a small group has got three uh, so people, they'll just do three particular schools of thought. Yeah? Is it too late to change our groups? Pardon? Is it too late to change our groups? Supposed to speak up again? Is it too late to change our groups? Um, no, it's not too late. Okay, you can shuffle the groups again. I'm happy to do that, but I've got to do it today because we have to decide who's doing week seven, eight, and nine today because that's week seven, eight, and nine are you know about a month away. So you've got four weeks to work on both an essay and a group presentation. So it's tight. But once, if you come with a different group to me today, then I'll shuffle the people around. Okay, and then once that's done, we're set. Okay. Um, now this, what, if I have to do reshuffling, I'm going to focus on those who are doing weeks 20 to 22 and where people have not allocate, have not actually chosen, so I've just simply allocated them automatically. So that'll happen, uh, oh great, 17 twice. That'll happen in future weeks. Is that cool enough? Yeah. Okay, but so during the break, work out, if you get all the groups worked out and tell me which subject you want to do. If there's not a quorum here, in other words, if you don't have all of your group, and that's quite possible because the class is a bit small today, tough luck for the others. Okay, you make the decision. That's partly, again, what happens with groups. Okay, if somebody doesn't turn up, they've got to wear what the people who are running the group and are here actually decide upon. So take a look at those topics and make a decision. So last week I talked about the mainstream, the dominant school of economic thought, the people that normally get the Nobel Prize. So the guy that won it today is not particularly from that school of thought. He's a behavioural economist. Uh, but what they have is the idea that utility is the basis of value. Uh, they talk about equilibrium. They're very mathematical. And they persisted with equilibrium despite proofs that it was unstable. This week I'll talk about the Austrians, and this is a gen I mean, I'm trying to find a generic way of saying what do they focus on, what's the question they look at. And they focus really upon innovation and change in capitalism. And there's the many that they, having said that, they've got many features that they have in common with the neoclassicals, um, but they evolved because they saw some weaknesses in that neoclassical perspective. And the main thing is that they, the neoclassicals used to talk, when I was a student like your age and studying in economics, they would talk about assuming perfect foresight. Ever heard that one? Okay. Assuming perfect foresight means assuming you can predict the future. Okay? Now, I'm not the only one who thought you've got to be kidding to that. So the Austrians said, look, you can't predict the future, it's uncertain. So we have limited knowledge rather than complete knowledge. They, the neoclassicals were happy to get the mathematics working. They assumed people have complete knowledge of the present. That became complete knowledge of the future as well under what they call rational expectations. Then the Austrians said, that's crazy. You can't assume that. So people have got limited information and what the market, the market's strength is it organises that limited information to reach a sensible outcome. They reject the mathematical approach due to what they call complexity. I'll be talking a bit about that later and whether they're right or not on that front. And they regard being out of equilibrium as an essential feature of capitalism. So rather than being in equilibrium, they're saying we're out of equilibrium, and that's actually, a, generally speaking, a good thing or cre a force for creation. And they try to explain cycles. Uh, if they do have any mentioning about how the, cap the economy behaves, it's cyclical, it's not in equilibrium, though they think they think you can achieve equilibrium uh, by improving, well, getting the government out of the way fundamentally. And they see money as having an essential role in capitalism, um, but they also believe the economy shouldn't be managed. It should be let to run its own behaviour. Okay. Now, when they're criticising equilibrium, uh, what they're starting off is saying they're criticising how neoclassicals treat knowledge. And if you look at what neoclassicals are willing to do, to be able to do the sort of mathematics they prefer to do, uh, they are willing to make assumptions that I think can be classified as frankly insane. Okay, I'm not going to be polite about this when I'm criticising any school of thought. This is a guy who won the Nobel Prize for the book I'm about to show you quotes from, uh, written in 1959. 
And he, he's, here he's saying, how do, how do we work out the mathematics? We're going to assume that a producer makes a production plan today for the entire future of the, the solar system. He doesn't say that, but that's what he's made now for the whole future. Okay, And this is a plan to uh, use quantities of inputs and the outputs, knowing the future, even if you don't know the technology that will make those combinations possible in the future. Okay? That's frankly insane. Okay? So the Austrians are reacting against... And the Austrians are the, aren't the only ones. The post-Keynesians also... Everybody reacts to this sort of assumption, so you've got to be joking. Uh, and now that's what he covered when he had this chapter on what he called certainty. There was another chapter on what he called uncertainty. And then he said, we extend it to uncertainty in such a way we redefine the commodity so the result of the theory of uncertainty is exactly the same as the theory of certainty. Okay. Something seriously wrong with a discipline that can end up with people like this getting a Nobel Prize. Formally identical with the theory of certainty. So the Austrians had a, a, you know, a justified reason to react to that sort of stuff. Now what Hayek, and he's the, one of the three leading personalities, Menger, uh, oh, sorry, well, Menger was the original, a guy called Menger, um, Hayek and Mises, von Mises, are the two personalities back in the 1930s that are associated with Austrian economics the same way Keynes is associated with Keynesian economics. And what Hayek had to say, I think it's his Nobel Prize speech, saying, we know the general character of what drives the economy and the general conditions under which those factors operate. We don't know the circumstances that they're going to cause a change to that system uh, because everything's interdependent. Okay. Even if you did know everything precisely at one moment, one change is going to affect the whole rest of the system. And so you simply can't have complete knowledge. Uh, so the chief task is getting a way, getting an economic system that enables the individual to operate based on particular knowledge where they don't have global knowledge. Okay. And that's seeing the market the way of organising limited information so we still get a decent outcome out of the market. Uh, and he says that the, when you look at what the market has to process, it's far more information than the individual mind could ever process. Now, what the neoclassicals were doing fundamentally is assuming every individual mind could process the entire market. Okay? You won't see it written in the textbooks that way, but I've shown you a quote from a Nobel Prize winner whose model, and when people talk about their mathematical models in neoclassical economics, they often talk about them being Arrow de Breur models. Well, Arrow de Breur means they're assuming what that guy de Breur put in his paper. So it is pretty, pretty crazy. So Hayek said that what the neoclassicals presume about equilibrium requires people to have a form of knowledge which is simply impossible. So you can only make this assumption of equilibrium if you assume people can accurately forecast what the consequences of any action they take today is going to be. Because what you do now affects what happens in the future. Therefore, the only way that you can have this sort of knowledge the neoclassicals uh, have is that you ha understand the consequences of actions now and the future. Nothing ever surprises you. Okay? Never make a mistake. Not quite never, but the, the mistakes cancel each other out. So he said we can we can find an, e an individual as being in equilibrium when, given their and this is this is very neoclassical in thinking here. You're talking about having a budget and tastes. That's have you done indifference curves at all? That been raised with you at all at school or university? Okay, that used to be taught in the first year when I went through, they put it in later years now. But the basic idea is they try to describe how much pe what people are going to buy of different commodities by trying to combine a budget that sets the maximum amount of money they can spend with their tastes, which is supposed to be smoothly varying between one good and another. And I showed you a bit of that in last week's lecture. So that's when you're in equilibrium. But that's for an individual. Now, when you talk at the entire market for an equilibrium, everybody's decisions has to be compatible with everybody else's decisions. Okay? Nobody makes a decision that makes somebody else upset. That would be an interesting world, wouldn't it? Okay? So what he's saying is that's not the world we live in. So consistency in the, for the entire economy requires everybody's plans to be consistent at the same time, and that simply is not possible. It's only possible under two circumstances. If our expectations about the future are the same, so we all have the same expectations about the future, so that's consistent, 
and that's what we plan on the basis of, and B, those assumptions are correct. They said that's just a crazy level of requirements for the neoclassical world to actually operate. So we're passing into a, uh, a totally different character. We, we, when we talk about equilibrium, and this is what you do in the micro area, if you work at equilibrium for an individual, you work at a budget constraint and taste, and you work out an amount that individual is going to consume, and bang, that looks like that person's in equilibrium. But if you jump to the whole economy and you're saying, let's do it for everybody, we've got to presume everybody's tastes are compatible with everybody else's decisions. That's just not going to happen. So what uh, Hayek had to say at the time was actually before a lot of the modern neoclassical economics developed. He's writing in the 1960s, this paper I'm quoting here, and that's late in his career too. Um, and what he's talking about is a fundamentally predicting to some extent where neoclassicals going to go with their own theories. They made it more uh, refined from their point of view. So equilibrium is a relationship between actions. It's not just an individual action, it's a relationship between actions of many. And since one person takes successively in time, then you've got to include time somehow in your concept of equilibrium. You can't be in equilibrium now. If you're going to fall, the next step is going to take you over the edge of a cliff, effectively. So many papers, he says, many economics papers don't include time. And it's at, pardon me, at the time he was writing, this is correct, most of them would assume equilibrium at a point and not mention time at all. What Hayek is saying here, to have a genuine concept of equilibrium, you've got to consider not just equilibrium for an individual, but everybody's plans are being consistent with everybody else's, and that's got to mean that what happens in the future is also consistent. So time has to be part of it. And neoclassicals hadn't grappled with that, but they started to in their own strange way. So he's saying back in 1937, actually, that um, leaving time out is just crazy. But that's what neoclassicals had done and continue to do. So for people to actually reach equilibrium, which the neoclassical model assumes they do, everybody has to have the same foresight and they have to be correct. And you can see that to some extent in what I showed you from Jabril, which is written virtually 30, 20 years after, more than 20 years after Pike's writing here. So your plans have to be based on the expectations of what other people are going to do. A simple example, if you're walking into a door and you want to open the door and somebody's pulling it shut at the same time, okay, that has to never happen. Yeah. You have to walk up to a door when you're pushing it open and somebody else is helping you in the same direction from the other side of the door. It just doesn't happen. So unless expectations are consistent, you can't have equilibrium. And because he says expectations won't be consistent, therefore you'll be in disequilibrium. So you simply can't have the vision that people know everything. Okay? You can know what suits you, but it's not going to be consistent with other people. And Neoclassicals will talk about a perfect market or a perfect competition. You've heard that expression? Okay. Well, he's saying this idea of a perfect market is another way of saying that equilibrium exists, but it doesn't really explain how do we get to that point where everybody's plans are consistent with everybody else, else's plans, and those, consistent, those plans are true about the future. Again, I'll put these slides up on Canvas. Has anybody accessed Canvas in the last set of lecture slides? I find you know, Canvas is another pretty dreadful software package from what I've found of using it so far, but I'll put all the slides up there after each week as well as a link to where I've recorded the, um, the lectures. So you don't need to take these notes down, it's, but it's to give you a... I take extensive notes from the literature so you've got a background to put it together and then you can go and read the references yourself at a later stage. So he said how they try to get this idea of equilibrium, and again this is him criticising neoclassicals. I haven't got onto how Austrians actually think themselves yet. Uh, but you need a perfect market for all commodities. The whole system must be like one perfect market where everybody knows everything. Um, and it means nothing unless we all know everything that's relevant at one particular point in time. Um, and this is, again, given when it's written, very prescient because neoclassicals, in a sense, were pushed towards having to assume this to hang on to their mathematical methods. They hadn't done it at the time Hayek was writing. But he said, the skeleton in the cupboard, the economic man, has returned in the form of a quasi-omniscient individual. So the neoclassical idea of rational is actually somebody who's effectively omniscient. 
the one who knows everything and can predict the future of the economy accurately. And that's what turns up in finance theory as well, as it happens. So decades after he made that point, you get the neoclassicals talking about how rational economic man comes about. Now, this is in not the 1960s. What was called the rational economic man became formalised by the neoclassicals. This is actually a, a paper trying to explain fluctuations in the prices of agricultural commodities. He said, I'd like to suggest that expectations which are informed predictions of future events. Not gambling, not speculation, not euphoria, not crowd sentiment, but informed predictions. They're essentially the same as the predictions of the theory. And this is, can anybody, this, this is an essential line in Muth's logic. Information is scarce and the economic system generally does not waste it. Okay. What does that imply to you about information? Is it free? Or does it cost money? If information is scarce, okay, would it be expensive or free? Expensive, wouldn't it? He assumes it's free. Now, if information is scarce, then according to the neoclassical theory, something which is scarce has a price. And then if it has a price, you're going to buy as much of that uh, until the marginal benefit of the extra information is equal to the marginal cost of acquiring it. So this is an argument for limited information. But that's not how Muth interpreted it. He said information is scarce, the system doesn't waste it, <coughs> therefore everybody knows everything. Now that's wrong. His own logic, he, he breaks his own logic here. If information is scarce, it's going to be costly. If it's costly, a rational person only uses enough of it so the benefit is equal to the cost of acquiring it. Uh, therefore, you wouldn't use all information if you were rational, and therefore your expectations won't be correct. So again, this is one reason, if you want to continue on in economics, why I insist you have to read the original papers, because what you read in the textbooks will not be as honest as quoting the original paper. Okay. And often it will say, this, this point, follows, point A follows from, point B follows from point A. No, it doesn't. If you assume information is scarce, then you can't assume None of it is wasted. Because if it's expensive, you're going to buy less than all of it. You're going to waste some of it. Okay? So there's really a lot of bad logic in the neoclassical way of thinking. And it's not just the Austrians who focus on it. In many ways, post Keynesians make almost identical critiques of the neoclassical school. But they went off and they built up in different foundations to build their positive theory of economics. So what the Austrians see is the market working because she takes limited information from lots of people and works out a reasonable approximation to a good idea in the aggregate. Um, so what we're pretending to solve is how the interaction of many, many people, each possessing small bits of information, bring about a state of affairs in which prices correspond to costs. No, they won't precise, in other words, in the Austrian's view, they won't precisely correspond to cost. There'll be a difference between prices and costs. And that's going to give an opportunity for somebody to exploit that difference. Uh, now, I said, we, we do. What, he, what he's saying here is pretty much saying, let's look at reality and does reality justify our theory? Because he's saying, we're talking about a level of coordination. And if we look at the real world, something like it seems to happen. Something of this sort seems to happen. Prices do tend to correspond to costs. Now. Is he pushing his argument too far there? Think about it. He's saying we have limited information. Uh, then it seems to bring out a situation where prices do correspond to costs. But if we have limited information, they shouldn't perfectly correspond, should they? They might be roughly close, but they're not going to correspond. So sometimes he pushes his case too far as well. So he said what we have to do is show what bits of information different people need to bring about that result. Um, and actually, no, he's actually critiquing, still critiquing the neoclassicals because if we assume we actually make them perfectly equivalent to price, prices and costs, we're assuming everybody knows everything again. So again, it's an argument for, for difference, for things being not quite in equilibrium, but close. Now, having said that he's critiquing equilibrium, he still tends to think we're fairly close to it. So if you imagine the neoclassicals talking about everything happening where supply and demand intersect, what Hayek is saying is always, we're roughly in that vicinity, but not quite on it. 
and therefore there's a gap between where we are and the equilibrium which people can exploit for making a profit okay? and therefore new ideas will come out of that that's that's the positive part of his argument so you're now going from a crit criticism to saying here's something which propels the development of capitalism over time so but he's still making an assumption he's He's got a foot in two, both camps. He's partly critiquing the neoclassicals quite validly, but he's hanging on to some of their ideas in developing his own positive theory. How justified is that? Um, but it's still, he's still making a very valid critique of what neoclassicals assume about knowledge. And they also criticise the model they have, that the Austin neoclassicals have a competition. So what the neoclassical model of perfect competition assumes, this again is quoting Hayek, is you have a homogenous commodity. Who's got a phone here? No, you don't. You've got an Apple. You've got a Samsung. Okay. We call it phone. There are fairly substantial differences in the technology, which leads to you buying one brand over another. Okay. So what they're saying is the neoclassical model would just be there'd just be a thing called a phone. Uniform, homogenous, um, and lots and lots of people buying it. None of whom think they can influence the price. You need free entry. So a, a car manufacturer can start making phones one day and stop making phones the next. And you need complete knowledge, again, of all members in the market of how it operates. And he said that's, that simply doesn't make any sense when you look at how competition actually occurs. So if, if there was only phones, just a phone and that's it, when you bought a phone, you bought a phone, how could you compete with people, different people manufacturing a phone? What could you compete on? What's, what's left, if everything is exactly the same commodity, how's the only way one producer can compete over another? Yeah. Price. Price, absolutely, yeah. But when you've got the, the Apple and Samsung, who made a decision to buy a, a Samsung feature, phone based on its features against the Apple? Anybody? Or the other way around? Yeah? I'm getting sick of my Apple phone, by the way. The damn thing doesn't ring. I don't know why. I can't... It, I've got eight telephone calls yesterday and I didn't hear a single one of them ring. So I'm looking to buying a Samsung yes. to get... Pardon? Yes. Yep. Yeah. The cover is Pardon? The cover is terrible. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, well, there you go. So we're debating the features. So what you, you don't have a homogenous market. You've got a market where the same function is fulfilled by a range of products, but they vary in different ways. So the competition is by varying the features. So you look at cars, Ford and Ferrari. Do you think Ford's, Ford competes with Ferrari? No, okay, different segments of the market. Toyota and Tesla, to some extent maybe, but not a lot. So, and they don't compete on price, they compete on features and they segment the market. So this is actually a much more realistic vision of how markets actually function. Uh, we don't have homogeneity, we have a, a generic range of features that a particular device fulfills but it will fulfill that in different ways and it will add different features to it. So the phones are an important issue with mobile phones these days, aren't they? Okay. Does anybody here own a camera? Yeah. Anybody? Okay, a few. Who doesn't own a camera? Who use their, their phone for everything? Yeah. Okay, I've got a couple of phones, but I don't think I've turned them on in three or four years. Okay. So the technology competes with other industries as well. So what you get is an evolutionary idea of competition. Um, it's not whether we get things at their marginal cost, which is the neoclassical focus. It's what can be satisfied by what's manufactured and how can we expand and expand the range of features that are satisfied by a particular class of products. So what we've got is a, not a marginal cost and everybody trying to get down to the lowest possible cost, but trying to find new ways of doing things better than they've been done before. Did anybody watch... I'm, I'm a great fan of Elon Musk, by the way bit of a, a Musk junkie. Did anybody watch his presentation in Adelaide? What was the most remarkable thing to you about that? <laughs> yeah, you, you watched it? Yeah. What, did you, what was the most striking thing you think about it? The, the Mars stuff or what? Um, I watched the recent one with the new, the new kite bringer. The new rocket, yeah. yeah. What, did anything strike you particularly about it? Uh, no, I just watched it. <laughs> <laughs> part, part that threw me is he's... He's designing a rocket to get to Mars, okay? And that's... Oh, yeah, yeah, that's you know what he's also yeah. suggesting doing with the rockets? Yeah, 
Yeah, Intercontinental. Yeah, you'd fly from Shanghai to New York in 39 minutes. Okay. It'd be a fairly exciting flight. You'd be experiencing 5Gs of acceleration and braking and weightlessness. But that's pretty cool. So this is, again, a key evolutionary issue here. All economic problems are created by unforeseen changes which require adaptation. And so what you get is an adaptive idea of what happens in competition. So markets are a place where differentiated products, not identical, products which differ from each other but fulfil a similar range of functions, uh, and they co-evolve. Your tastes change, okay, and therefore what you buy in a phone changes over time. Okay. Anybody heard of Nokia? Yeah. Anybody buy a Nokia phone? Do they exist? Okay. So that's, that's the, a very different vision of competition as well. Now, one of the areas they differ with the neoclassicals is they're pretty much anti-mathematical. Uh, is our student who, a friend who was at the City University last year here? here? Not about, okay. But remember one of the students from City University is now here because of visa issues said that the whole first two years were just mathematical exercises at City. That's what you normally get for a first year economics class, which you're not getting from me, obviously. Austrians are very anti-mathematical, but it's not anti-mathematics per se when you read Hayek. He's saying you can use the wrong mathematics. And he says, um, he said, I don't generally reject mathematical methods. He said, the great advantage of mathematics is you can write down a pattern where you're ignorant of the actual numbers. We can say this is the overall pattern for competition or pattern for um, what's going to happen with wages, but we don't necessarily know the actual data at this point in time. Um, and he said that's really been helpful. So the mathematics that the neoclassicals did and other economists have done, he said, was helpful in get clarifying some of our ideas. But he said the main problem is the economy is a complex system and he reckons you can't mathematically model that. What he has to say on that front is that uh, there's so many variables, such a large number of variables interacting, that you could never write down a set of equations that captured all of them. And therefore, that's, that's his problem with mathematics. What he's saying is that the world is too complicated. Okay? Too complicated. But a word he's using here is complexity. And I'm going to show you the two different words and show you an example of why. So this is his lecture of getting the Nobel Prize in 1974. So he's saying, it's because it's so complex, we can't mathematically model it. Now, he's both right and he's wrong. Because what he calls complexity is correct, from my point of view as well, the work that I do with mathematically modeling the economy. Uh, it is a complex system. But complexity comes out of how things are connected together, how one thing interacts with something else. Uh, but it abounds. It isn't just in the social sciences you find complexity. You also find it in the physical sciences. Complexity is the rule in many ways these days in how physical sciences analyse the world they're looking at. Uh, but he's wrong to say complexity means there's lots and lots of moving parts. Imagine like a Swiss watch. It's got lots and lots of moving parts. Therefore, you might call it complex. It's actually not complex. It's complicated because complexity comes out of simple rules that give rise to complex behaviour. So you, have a, you can have actually a small number of variables, but they interact in such a way that the interactions vary depending upon the magnitude of the variables and vary quite dramatically. And they're first discovered by the guy. This, when you see a blue bit, of course, it's hyperlinked. That'll take you to an academic paper or a website giving you more details in the lecture. And I do recommend doing that when you look at the slides yourself later. But this was first discovered in meteorology by a guy called Edward Lorenz. And what he was is he was a mathematical meteorologist. You've all watched those computer maps on the screen, TV screen, showing him movements of hurricane. There's a new hurricane, is there? Hurricane Nate. I had a bit of a break over the weekend. There's a new hurricane. Welcome to the weather. But <laughs> back when he was writing, which is over half a century ago now, what mathematicians tended to use was linear models. So if you have, with a linear model, if something, let's say the wind's, wind's, uh, wind's 10 times as fast, then you get 10 times the force out of the wind. Does that sound realistic to you? It's not, okay? The force of the wind actually goes with a cube of its speed. So something 10 times as fast has got 1,000 times the force. 
Okay, so that, that's a nonlinearity, a simple nonlinear, because you're being pushed by the volume of air coming at you. Okay, it's the cube of stuff coming at you, not the speed of a of a, of a straight line. So this is, and what what math, what mathematical meteorologists were using in the 60s is similar to what neo neoclassicals use today, in that they presume everything is linear. So with a linear system, things everything is additive. Okay, if you want to see what's going to happen, you add everything together. There's no interaction between the variables. Whereas what Lorenz said is, well, the weather's actually driven by interactions. Temperature interacts with wind, wind speed. Okay. Density interacts. Moisture interacts, etc., etc. And so it's not... Um, the behaviour doesn't depend just on the individual elements, which is, which is what happens with a linear system. With a linear system, you're just adding all the bits together. You might multiply one number. You might have A times X plus B times Y, and A and B change how much X and Y affect the system. But if X is 10 times as big as it in, in one situation as another, then it's going to add 10 times as much to the outcome with a linear system. But if you have A times X times Y, then what happens with X depends upon the value of Y as well, and they can multiply each other. So the connections matter. And what Lorenz did, and I won't try to explain how he did it because it's incredibly complicated mathematics, but he ended up with a model of just three to describe the, the fundamentals of the weather, just had three variables and three constants. That's it, which sounds really, really simple. And uh, that's the set of equations done in my software package, Minsky. I'm hoping my mouse has woken up. It hasn't still. Okay. So beta, rho, and sigma were the values he had. X, Y, and Z were the variables. And these are the equations. Do they look simple here? Yeah, they're not particularly complicated, are they? And that's the idea. This is a simple system. But what you got was complicated behaviour. And Hayek thought you needed a complicated system to get complicated behaviour. What Lorenz showed, no, actually a simple system gives complicated behaviour. So this is the... And it's not a really a mistake by Hayek because he couldn't know this. So mathematics wasn't established until after he wrote. But it's actually a very simple system can give you complex behaviour. So this is Lorenz model in equilibrium. And uh, I think I've got it. OK. So you can you can basically see, I haven't got my magnifier toy with me, unfortunately. I can't zoom that up. But you can see just straight lines, flat lines, equilibrium, nothing happening. That's what happens out of equilibrium. A bit more interesting. So it arises from interactions, but it doesn't require a complicated model. Now, I hope I've got a simulation of that here. Let's see. Yep, here we go. Okay. So this is just the three equations. I'll just zoom in so you can see the equations a bit better. That's value, value for x, value for y, and value for z. And if we start in equilibrium, you get a flat line. Nothing happens. Okay. That's the definition of equilibrium. Nothing is changing over time. Now, if I just give a tiny shock on one step to that system and then go back and get rid of the shock, so it only happens once. Ah, great, I've got a bug. Let's see. Oh, great. This is an old version of the software. I might load it the latest version. Same basic model, out of equilibrium. That's the sort of behaviour it gets you. And I could run that model for infinity, and it would never reach equilibrium. In fact, there are three equilibria in that system. Uh, one's in the middle of that bullseye, the other's in the middle of that bullseye, and the third is down here somewhere. And you can see it never goes to where the equilibrium are. So that was the beginning of people reading in mathematical terms, that a simple system could be an accurate description of the underlying dynamics of something like the weather or the economy, but never be in equilibrium. 
So that's both confirming Hayek in one sense but going beyond him in another because Hayek thought you couldn't mathematically model it. But in fact, it turns out you can, but it's, it doesn't require complicated systems. It's systems that interact with each other. So complicated does not mean complex. So Hayek's followers still reject mathematical methods as it happens. I don't think there was aware that Hayek was allowing a, a loophole there. I think he may have embraced those. If he'd actually seen this coming out of mathematical models, he may have embraced them. Okay, now what they believe, is, this is going back to the, the Austrians' vision, they believe that if there's no innovation, no change in technique, like the phones don't have to change over time, then you're likely to reach equilibrium uh, and that it'd be stable. Now we know those are both mathematically false, as it happens. But he believed they would be disturbed by innovation, so new ideas would come along. And he said that's the main strength of capitalism. Now I'm going to talk about another guy now called Joseph Schumpeter. People who call themselves Austrian economists deny that Schumpeter is an Austrian economist. Okay. I think they don't know what they're talking about. A, a he is Austrian, but B, I think the, the insights that he had were based on the same foundations that Hayek had about limited information, uncertainty, and evolutionary change. And that, to me, is the strength of the Austrian vision. So he's Austrian by birth. <coughs> he's regarded as the person who was the founder of evolutionary economics. So there's a bit of an overlap in that sense between the Austrian school and the evolutionary school. Uh, but they reject him because he's not as anti-government as they are. Most Austrians are vehemently anti-government. If you look at those, that first lecture I gave you, I had the two, uh, the guy talking about praxeology and the bloke criticising neoclassical economics, those two above on the left-hand side of the screen. They are anti-government. The government should get out of the way and things will work better. Um, Kai, um, Schumpeter wasn't that anti-government and he also wasn't as pro-capitalist. He <coughs> had criticisms of capitalists as well. Um, and he actually argued that capitalism would give way to socialism. I think that was a terrible book, by the way. Uh, when I first read that book, I thought, why do people worry about Schumpeter? Uh, I realised he wrote some better stuff before that. But his ideas about disequilibrium and the entrepreneur make a lot of sense. So this is going beyond what people would call Austrian in particular. So if you're thinking about doing this particular approach to each of the three questions, I'm pushing the envelope a bit on Austrians, but I think it's justifiable to include Schumpeter there. So he said he also accepted the neoclassical description of equilibrium in general as an accurate model of an unchanging economy. Okay, so he, again, there's some similarities with the neoclassicals in some parts of his vision. And he saw profit as a surplus. So obviously you've got to get more money coming in than you pay out, so there's got to be a surplus there. But he said in equilibrium, receipts will exactly equal cost in all industries. If you have this supply and demand idea that neoclassicals have, supply equaling demand in all markets, he said overall there'll be no surplus because you're selling everything at the marginal cost. He said wages equal the marginal product of labour. Capital gets the marginal product of capital in the theory. Um, and you get said, zero profit coming out of that because if capitalists are buying labour at its marginal products and therefore paying everything back that workers contribute, paying it back to workers, and if they're hiring machines and paying for the hire of the machines, there's nothing going to be left over in equilibrium. They said profit won't happen in, a non in an equilibrium system, but that's the driving force of capitalism. So he said, well, it's a driving force, but not in equilibrium. So his idea was um, you have a neoclassical theory describing a situation with no change, uh, and that's a set of rest, given one set of data. But it ignores what happens when a change comes along. So somebody invents a new form of screen for mobile phones. Or somebody... Has anybody bought um, those um, goggles for looking at 3D games yet? OK. They're coming. They certainly exist. But ultimately, it's quite possible you'd wear glasses to watch your computer screen rather than having a screen at all. OK, they're getting better and better at that technology. Well, what Schumpeter said is profit comes out of somebody taking that process of change. So you have a, you're in a situation of equilibrium. Somebody invents a new way of doing something. While that new way is being developed, they make a profit. So you see, conventional economics can't understand profit uh, or pricing or strategy. You need to look at discontinuous change, things that disturb equilibrium. 
this is how I put it here. I'll, I'll finish with this slide and give you a chance to um, talk about what to do with your groups, which weeks, and so on. So he said, neoclassical economics describes economic life from the point of view of a tendency towards equilibrium, which gives us a way of talking about prices and quantities. Uh, but they fail when the data changes, and when the data changes not smoothly, but in fits and starts. He said static analysis, equilibrium analysis, can say um, it, it can't talk about what's going to happen with this continuous change. It can't explain re revolutions in production. Uh, it can only talk about a new equilibrium after the new technology settles down. And that's not the right way to go. So he talks about, and I'll, I'll finish with this slide. He says, let's use the neoclassical idea of general equilibrium to describe a situation of rest. And then he says there's going to be qualitative change taking place. And profit will come out of one of five types of change. So you introduce a new good. Thinking again of Elon Musk's presentation, a rocket to travel between Shanghai and New York is clearly a new good. Okay. A new method of production. Well, in that sense, you can also say rockets rather than jets. Different again. Opening of a new market. That might be opening up, well, originally opening up China. That's well and truly happened. But let's say India expands, a new market for goods in India. A new source of supply of raw materials. That's what the oil industry is looking for all the time. All the new organisations, so mergers and acquisitions. Is that those are classifying five reasonable classifications of different types of change. And he says, when you get a new product coming out and a new price turning up, then you overturn everything you get taught in static equilibrium economics, but only when you're out of equilibrium. And let's make it out of the lecture now. Ten minutes worth. Work, take a look on, on Canvas, see which group you're in, and um, decide which topic you like, and we'll work that out in the beginning of the lecture in about ten minutes' time. Okay? Disequilibrium vision of what happens in capitalism. So. Any, any model, even if you're doing a verbal model, you're going to make simplifying assumptions. And this is one of the big um, areas of contention in economics. So I was criticising the neoclassical for making crazy assumptions, totally unrealistic ones. Normally, a simplifying assumption should say, most of the people do this, let's assume everybody does that and ignore the few who don't do a particular thing. That's the easy way to go about a simplifying assumption. Like, for example, if you said 90% um, of soft drinks are Coca-Cola, let's just assume all soft drinks are Coca-Cola and forget about the 10% that aren't. That's a simplifying assumption. If you said 90% of Coca-Cola, uh, so I'm going to assume they're all Fanta, okay, that's not a simplifying assumption, that's a fantasy. Okay. Uh, what Schumpeter does sort of bridges the two. He assumes all innovation is done by new firms. Now, is that true? It's not, isn't it? Okay. But is it harder for new firms to innovate than old firms? Probably, because they haven't got any money to begin with. Okay, So he's making an assumption that makes it harder to prove his case. So I think this is a good assumption. He says, all innovation is done by new, new firms. So he's leaving out you know, innovation by established companies. He's saying people are forming new companies to do innovation. So that's an interesting... It makes it harder to reach his conclusions, I think. He said, it also assumes everything's fully employed. Now, is that the truth? No, there's unemployed workers, unemployed resources in general. So that's not true either. But he's saying, let's assume that that's the case because, again, it makes it harder for an entrepreneur to get going. If everybody's got a job and you're an entrepreneur and you need to hire people to do new things, you've got to take them away from where they currently are. So, again, it's an assumption that makes it harder to reach the sort of case he's making. So he said it's a favourable condition that you can find unemployed resources to use, but let's assume that it's not the case. You've got to actually, if you want to use anything, you've got to buy it or hire it from where it's currently being employed. You've got to attract workers away from existing jobs, which makes it harder to say how innovation is going to occur. So I think that that's, again, what I'd classify as a good assumption. Um, and he's saying that's always the case. So having done that, he said, well, the first stage is you need a concept. So you've got to have some idea that is worth pursuing. For example, the rocket idea of Elon Musk. The rockets don't exist at the moment, do they? Okay. They're a design. Okay. So to make them, you've got to get resources. 
But if you've got, if this has actually been proposed by a totally new firm, not by a Tesla, but by a totally new firm, they'd have to somehow get the resources to make rockets when all the resources were currently employed doing other things. So he said, how are you going to do it? Well, you've got to have money. And if you don't have money, where do you get money? You've got to borrow it from the bank. So he says, entrepreneurs, as people who borrow money from the bank to have money and use that money to, to buy existing resources to take them away from what they're currently doing and do something new. So he said, they're, they're capitalists. He's what he calls capitalists, we would call venture capitalists, I think. Okay. People who have money that they give to new ideas in the hope that the new idea will make an outrageous profit. If you saw the stuff that Musk was talking about again, and I really do recommend watching that presentation for an ultimate entrepreneur's presentation because at one stage he shows the payload that can be blasted into space by a whole range of rockets, with the smallest rocket being the Falcon 1, that he was the very first rocket they got to work, and the largest being the one they're designing now. So that's the scale. And then he showed the cost per launch. It was the other way around. Because the Falcon 9, when it went up, it came crashing back down again. It was wiped out. The new one is supposed to be completely reusable. So the cost per launch is the other way around. So venture capitalists provide the money. And he said they get it. It comes out of the banks creating new purchasing power. And this is a very important point. This is different, by the way. If anybody is using my lecture as a guide to what Austrians think, this is not what Austrians think about money. Okay? This is one place where Schumpeter differs from the Austrians. Austrians are critics of what they call fractional reserve banking. And they really, most Austrians think money should be gold or some sort of commodity. So it's very different about Austrians. Do I have to clarify even though I see Schumpeter as being in the Austrian school, he differs with money. He's more like a post-Keynesian on money. What he's saying here is banks create money out of nothing. Yeah? You said that Austrians are a critique of fractional... Yeah, critics. Okay. Fractional reserve banking. Um, that's uh, Again, I'll talk about that more with the post-Keynesians next week. But that's the idea that banks lend out reserves. Have you heard that expression at all? Okay, so they think that should they think that's fraud. They think banks taking in deposits, hanging on to 10%, lending out 90, is a fraud. So they're very. You see, Costrians about money. They're all arguing you should abolish the central bank, the central bank, or abolish the Bank of England, abolish the Federal Reserve, and they go back to having money as gold. Those are their sorts of ideas. This is not Schumpeter. He's very, very different. But he says banks create money by double entry bookkeeping. They simply give you a loan and they give you the cash. The loan is a debt. The cash is an asset in a deposit account which you can spend. So they see that as creating money. Um, and he sees the banker as the ultimate capitalist. This is written back in the 1930s, by the way. So it predates what we call venture capital today and it predates the stock market bubble and all this sort of stuff as well. So he sees the banker doesn't, isn't a middleman who provides money from a warehouse effectively which is the fractional reserve banking sort of idea. He's saying instead they produce money. <coughs> and he says money plays an essential role in capitalism. And this might sound uncontroversial, but remember I talked back about the neoclassicals. They model capitalism as if it's a barter system, where money plays no essential role, apart from meaning that you don't have to barter with somebody else who's got exactly what you want. Okay? You barter for money as an, individual, as an intermediate step, but money plays no substantial role in the way the neoclassicals think, but for Schumpeter, it's essential. So once you've got the money, you've got an entrepreneur with a new, a new firm wanting to make a rocket to fly to, from New York to Shanghai, uh, got the money to build it, then you start combining those products together. And that's not management, he said. Uh, and this is a, a lot of what neoclassicals talk about about the entrepreneur or about, about management is about doing things efficiently. What Schumpet is talking about is doing things for the very first time. Again, I recommend watching that presentation by Musk because what's the unique thing about his rockets? That they land back on the earth again in one piece. Okay. Well, he mentions they had three successive uh, failures of their first rocket to even take off. Only the fourth one worked. And then when they tried to land them, I think about the 16th or so, actually landed successfully. 
they had all the failures beforehand. So that's not management because nobody's ever done it before. That's doing something unique. So that's what he calls as entrepreneurs. And he said, um, if you think about this, what he called the circular flow is just continuing doing current stuff using current technology. Okay. That's the equilibrium situation for Sean Pater. And he said, that's not what an entrepreneur does. That's management. If you're managing, producing stuff that currently exists using existing technology, that's management. Um, they're, not, they're not entrepreneurs. Whereas neoclassical theory talks about them as if they are entrepreneurs. He said, an entrepreneur is somebody who does something that's never been done before. Some unique new idea. And it's very different to profit maximising. Profit maximising is getting managing to get the, the right gap between your costs and your profits to maximise your profits. Okay? That's management. What Schumpeter sees uh, with entrepreneurs is coming up with a whole new idea and making a devastatingly large profit or, for a lot of them, a devastatingly large loss when they disappear. This is a, a, a book on managerial economics. This is what a manager does is produce as long as price exceeds variable cost and price where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's what they see as management. Now, what Schumpeter says is, well, that's only going to be possible if what you're talking about is a known procedure. Carrying, a, and this is a wonderful statement to summarise the difference, carrying out a new plan and acting towards a customary one are as different as making a road to walking along an existing road. Okay? The entrepreneur makes the new road. The manager makes sure the car sticks to the existing road or tries to. So it's a very different vision of what entrepreneurs are. Now, you can't know, of course, what the impact of a new product is going to be. That rocket might never work in flying from New York to, to Shanghai. Or it might be not profitable because people aren't willing to go through 5G, weightless and 5G again. Or it might work for cargo but not work for people. And it might not enough make enough money. Okay, these are all the things you simply can't know. It's uncertain. You're only guessing. So you can't, therefore, be optimising. You're taking a risk. And that's the unique thing about an entrepreneur. And this, in this sense, what Sean Bader has to say is a bit like what Keynes talks about when he says animal spirit. So we've got three stages. You have a new concept, backed by credit created by banks, so it's new money and it's new demand, carried out by the entrepreneur. So you're building this stuff. Now, when you're building new rockets and you've taken people away from existing Industries. What do you think happens to the economy? Does it boom or slump? You've brought new money into existence. You've had to bring people away from where they're currently working. You probably better pay them more money. Okay. You cause a boom. So you see, as the original stage is boom, a boom occurs, then a slump afterwards. But he's saying you've got to do all this. Your, your reason for doing it is to make a profit. So how can you do all this stuff and make a profit? Well, he says. First of all, you create new money. The new money that the bank gave you is something you can grab some of to make a profit from. But you also change the price level. Now imagine, has anybody here flown from, uh, from here to Shanghai? Or, yep, okay. 12 hour flight? Okay, so a long flight. Okay, imagine if you could do it in say 20 minutes. Okay, what price would you be willing to pay? Yeah, you might be willing to pay more for it, or it might be much so much cheaper that many, many more people do it. So you want to make a surplus over costs in doing that. Uh, and he says, you can't do that in the circular flow because the receipts just cover the costs. Um, so it's not, there's no profit there. But the entrepreneur is using new technology, and that new technology can mean given current costs, like it might cost a thousand pounds return to go from here to Shanghai on an economy ticket. But if he can say, I can do that for half the cost, for 500 pounds rather than 1,000 pounds, and I can charge 900 and undercut the market, <coughs> and I can make a profit. So he goes through various ways these can happen. And the example he gives in this book is the power loom, which is the first way of automating the making of cloth from the original hand way of doing it. So you had a 
a machine like this which would weave all the uh, uh, cloth together, the cotton back in the 1900s, and you had sweatshops. You can notice that all the workers there are female. The men were working in coal mines and other appalling situations, blast furnaces and so on. That's a more advanced cloth making machine. Um, and there's the sweatshop. You actually relocate production to a third world country now using that old technology. And then you get machines like this, which are making modern cloth. Okay. And then some of that passes on to a third world country as well, and so on. So what's going to happen in the future? Will we be making clothing using biotechnology? Will nanotechnology make clothing? Those are quite serious possibilities. So what he sees is his example of how you make a profit. You're looking at textile industry to begin with, and it's hand, hand weaving. Have anybody seen a hand weaving machine? Yeah, OK. Man, the manual shuttle, you've got to do it push the threads in and so on. So you look at that and you see that's what's currently possible. And you imagine power looms, and you borrow from a bank to get the money to make it. Now a worker might make six times as much as a hand worker can. On the same, again back to Elon Musk's example, he thinks that the cost change of going from a non-reusable rocket to a reusable rocket is about 100 times cheaper, rather than it being $60 million per launch because you've got to throw away the launch vehicle, it's $600,000 per launch because all you're doing is refueling and doing a small amount of refurbishing of things like heat shields. So they get an enormous gap, and that's quite feasible. It does happen, huge job costs like that. So he said, with three conditions, if you can produce six times as much, <clears throat> then under three conditions, you'll make a profit. The first is you don't drive the price down so much when the new supply comes online that you wipe out your profit. So again, if you imagine when the new technology of rocket, if it does actually work, if rockets flying from New York to Shanghai in 39 minutes replace a plane flight from New York to Shanghai taking 15 hours, then initially there'll still be, most people are going to be taking the 15 hour option because there won't be enough seats on the rockets. So the price won't come down that fast. So that's the first condition. Secondly, the cost of the power loom must be below the cost of the five workers you've replaced. Okay. Now, again, the same sort of thing you can think of in that example of the rocket. Okay. The rocket has to be much cheaper than the 747s and A380s we currently use for the same process. And you think about what's involved. What's, one of the, what's, a, what's an obvious... Well, it's not obvious. But what's the difference between having a, flying a plane from one place to another and flying a rocket from one place to another? No pilot. Pardon? No pilot. No pilot, that's true, because it's actually automated. I wasn't thinking about that. You reduce the pilot cost. No airline. And now air airport's the other one. Because to land a plane, you've got to have a two or three mile long, you know, strip of land for the plane to slow down. Uh, and all the infrastructure that goes with a place like Heathrow. If this works, you'll need a barge floating off Shanghai and another barge floating off New York. Okay, which is still technological, but they're far cheaper than airports. So there's those sorts of advantages. Um, then you don't want to drive up the costs of all the inputs you're buying so much that the extra cost eliminates your profit. Now, again, when you're talking something like developing rockets, one of the main costs Musk spoke about there was building carbon fibre tanks to hold the, the kerosene and the, and the oxygen that are part of the fuel of the rocket. So he's driven up the cost of carbon fibre, but not as much as it would mean that he can no longer make a profit out of putting the rocket together. So if those three conditions apply, he can make a profit. And that's the discontinuous change that Sean Pate is talking about. So just imagine you've got, you start from hand labour and you're paying your workers $100 a day and the machine depreciates at $100 a day and there's six workers. So that's your situation to begin with. and a machine which depreciates at $100 a day. Then you have a new machine, and you get rid of uh, one, all but one of the workers, but it drives up wages by, say, um, $1 a day, and the $100 in depreciation becomes $200. Then you're going to have 
uh, let's say the price is driven down as well by one dollar a day for a day's output. So you're going to make a four hundred dollar profit, roughly, out of that, and then the profit will fall as new tech, new people come along copying your technology. So when Musk first does this, he actually does do it with rockets that replace A380s and reduce travelling time by a factor of 10 and possibly also reduce the cost, then, of course, Boeing is going to be trying to make rockets and Airbus will try to make rockets. So the price, the margin that he's got will fall as the technology gets adopted. So you get spontaneous and discontinuous change as an essential part of that vision. Now, I emphasise I'm moving well outside what Austrians themselves talk about uh, in general. This is compatible with them, but Schumpeter differs on the money point, so be careful about that if you're, doing, if you're thinking about doing the Austrian part for one of your cases. And he sees the entrepreneur as being the person bringing about evolutionary change and new profit coming out of the development of new ideas. Now, of course, when that happens, imagine the rockets now exist and we're now getting people flying rockets from New York to Shanghai and London to Beijing and so on, what's going to happen to companies like Boeing and uh, British Airways? They're going to be cactus, aren't they? They're going to start having to cut their prices, lay off workers, cut back investment plans, try to compete in various ways. But what's going to happen coming out of that is a slump. Okay. So there's a boom when they first start doing this technology and a slump when, you, when you're building the technology, you're not competing with anybody else because you haven't got a new product. And you're actually driving up demand for other people because you're hiring workers from different areas. Once it exists, then you're undercutting existing industries. Okay. And therefore, you're making a profit, but other people are going to make a big loss. One doesn't necessarily counteract the other, by the way, but that's, that's the tendency. So... Here he's seeing the banking system are playing a central role of adding to demand. Now that, again, as I said, is not what the Austrians talk about, but it's very different to the neoclassicals. Neoclassicals see money as just being what they call a veil over barter. What Schumpeter is seeing money here is as an enabler of new ideas. Okay, a big difference. So you disrupt the equilibrium. You were in balance beforehand when everybody's flying A380s and Boeing 747s for that for that task. Now you've got this new technology coming in. You disturb everything. And you get a complete reorganization of industry. Again, just that's why I love the example of the rockets taking place of jets, because that's just as huge as going from intercontinental ships taking you between continents to aeroplanes. It's as big a jump as that. Quite a huge change. So what you find is uh, the profit will disappear over time. And when you imagine when the first when the first aeroplanes came out and they were replacing having to get an intercontinental liner to go between New York and London, let's say. So the journey from New York to London. Remember the Titanic movie? You all seen it all heard about that? Okay. That was the sophisticated and fast way to get between the two locations. And it took about, I don't know, maybe what a week? I'm not sure. Two weeks. Okay. Now we do it in twelve six hours and don't even think about it. What Musk is talking about is making that six hours down to 20 minutes. So it would actually be possible in, in that world for somebody to live in London and work in New York. Okay. Quite, a, quite an amazing change. But that's the profit coming out of the innovation, disturbing that circular flow, making a huge jump in uh, the cost of doing something or the possibilities of doing something and making a profit out of that. <coughs> and you get a cycle coming out of that. And Hayek, to some extent, is consistent with, um, with um, Sean Pate here. So I'll play our mate Hayek from that rap I showed you. This study isn't the buzz. It's the boom that should make you feel leery. That's the thrust of my theory. The capital structure is key. Malinvestments wreck the economy. The boom gets started with an expansion of credit. The Fed sets rates low. What you starting to get it? Now, what he's blaming... I'll stop. Hayek, shut up, man. I can't stop the damn thing. Now, 
the Fed sets rates low. Are you starting to get it? That new money is confused for real loanable funds. But it's just inflation that's driving the ones who invest in new projects like housing construction. The boom affects the seeds for its future destruction. The savings aren't real, consumption's up too. And the grasping for resources reveals there's too few. So the boom turns the bus as the interest rates rise. For the cost of production, price signals were lies. The boom was a binge, that's a matter of fact. Now Oh, great. <laughs> Talking about technology. That's cute. Hasn't happened before. Okay. With devalued capital that makes up the slack. But the rest of the late 20s or 2005, booming bad investment seems like they thrive. You must save to invest. Don't use the printing press. Or a bus will surely follow. An economy depressed. Your so called stimulus will make things worse. Just more of the same. More incentives perverse. And that credit crunch ain't a liquidity trap. Just the broke bank is just a that's a wrap. Okay, now I didn't manage to stop that. That's different to what Schumpeter is talking about, because Schumpeter is seeing the money coming out of borrowing money from the banks by an entrepreneur, creating extra money, stimulating the economy and leading to a cycle. What he's focusing here is saying it's all the Federal Reserve's fault. There's an equilibrium, natural rate of interest. Okay? If you push that, if the actual rate is pushed below the natural rate, as he sees it, then entrepreneurs, and he's got a managerial view of entrepreneurs there, not the Schumpeterian idea, but people who are walking along the road rather than building a new one, they'll be encouraged to invest in existing businesses like property, <coughs> share market speculation. That'll cause a boom. There's malinvestment because they're, they're investing out of equilibrium, and then there'll be a slump on the other side. So Hayek's version, that's more the standard Austrian view. Um, but what they're seeing is a tendency for the system to be cyclical, booms and busts. Whereas the neoclassicals say, well, it's going to be an equilibrium unless an exogenous shock comes along. Now, if you look at, and this is now back to Austrians in general, this is looking at the annual uh, rate of growth of the US, GD, US economy, GDP growth rate. You can see it's been as high as 17.5% change in one year, and that's real, not inflation, that's straight adjust, inflation adjusted, and as low as minus 10, okay? So, and that's the, the blue line is a smooth curve between the two, between the actual data, but you can see how different the actual data is to, the, to a smooth trend. Now, what the neoclassical says, that's all shocks, exogenous shocks. What the Austrians say is the cycle's caused by ups and downs of the interest rate. Um, and they see the cycles as intrinsic. Schumpeter has got a very creative way of saying that. The cycles are part of what he calls creative destruction. But the Austrians, uh, the neoclassicals say the cycles due to an equilibrium system which is being shocked. Their analogy, and I think I've got it here, is actually a rocking horse. They say if you imagine you have a rocking horse, you know what a rocking horse is? Pretty old-fashioned kids, te kids' technology, but you know, a horse on a curved uh, set of, of the back of your legs. If you hit that with a club, it'll rock backwards and forwards. That's an uneven shock, and what the thing will do is slowly rock back to uh, equilibrium again. And that's the sort of vision that the neoclassicals have. Uh, there's a the propagation system, which you, you hit the rocking horse with a with a club. That's propagation. Um, sorry, the impulse. The impulse is you hit it with the club. The propagation is then you'll have the horse out of equilibrium, so it'll rock away and slowly settle back down to equilibrium again. And that's the neoclassical vision. Um, but what Schumpeter says, and what the Austrians have to some extent as well, is that they say there is the actual process of capitalism generates these shocks. Okay. Not shocks coming in from outside capitalism. So the neoclassicals, it's, you're hitting a rocking horse with a club, and that's where the cycles come from. The club is exogenous outside the economy. The rocking horse is the economy. It'll settle down to equilibrium again. That's their vision. The Austrians on the other side say they're generated by the monetary system. You can only get that adjustment between the two when you bring money in. Um, and there's they emphasise changes in the price of money as causing the cycle. So if interest rate is too low, there'll be a boom, but the boom will mean there are malinvestments and the malinvestments will fail. 
So a boom out of the investments to begin with, and then a slump when the investments fail. So Hayek and most Austrians are critics of bank credit in various ways and think it should be controlled more like a commodity, more stable. That's different to what I've shown you for Schumpeter, who says that's actually part of the creativity. So there's, again, watch out for that difference between the two. But they see the everything converging to equilibrium. They see the price for money as being the interest rate, and they think that that interest rate should reach equilibrium like everything else, and therefore there'd be less cycles if that happened. And they blame fractional reserve banking for meaning that it gets broken away from that. So what they're trying to explain is how do you keep the system in equilibrium or near equilibrium? And what they're saying is that there's a trade cycle around this equilibrium caused by monetary disturbances. Getting complicated now? Okay. So they see money as being the cause of all these cycles. So a lot of their ideas about reforming and reducing the cycles is to say we have to get rid of that. The current market for money has to be changed. So they want to, They say the interest rate should be setting an equilibrium between savings and investment. That's what they think is a desirable situation. Uh, and they say that would happen if there was no money, if we we're just bartering commodities between us. So they're saying there's something different about the monetary system that means we don't get equilibrium there, and that causes cycles in the rest of the economy. Um, and the problem they see is the capacity for the banking system to create additional demand when interest rates are set too low. And they blame the Federal Reserve for setting those rates too low. So he's saying we've got a monetary system where banks can create money and that can all cause to booms which are, lead to malinvestments. So this is different to Schumpeter. Schumpeter is saying these new ideas are financed by banks and they're good things which, which disturb the system in a creative way over time. What, um, what Hayek is saying is, well, if we didn't have these banks behaving that way, we'd be closer to equilibrium, and that's good. So he's saying, how can we get rid of these disturbances? How do we get rid of the uh, changes that happen? And they say, well, central banks cause it because they create too much money, too much base money. They keep the interest rate below what it should be, what they call the natural rate. And so they're saying that banking system causes these cycles. So there's a way in which the, the Austrians in, in general are critical of banking. Hayek is slightly more complicated than his followers on that front. Um, but they say there's three things will change the amount of money. There's inflows and outflows of gold, so they're seeing international trade causing those changes. Changes in the circulation of notes created by the central bank. And finally, the creation of deposits by the banks. Now, what they're talking about, what, what uh, Hayek is talking about here, is banks taking in money deposited by savers, keeping a refraction of that on hand as what they call reserves, and then lending out the remainder, 90%. Have you been through the money multiplier model yourselves at school? Okay. I'm going to be criticising that next week, by the way. But the Austrians accept that's an accurate description of what banks do. And they say that is actually where part of the uh, problem comes along because they expand credit more than it would happen if we were using, say, gold for money. Uh, and that then causes a, a rise in interest rates. And that stultifies the adjustment that, bank, that banking should be doing. So this, they see this, the money market as being a disturbing force in capitalism and they want to tame it. And most Austrians are in favour of using gold as money somehow. They don't actually explain how you can do that. Do you know how much gold there is on the planet, roughly? Any idea? Would it, would, could, you, could, you cover, could you cover London to a depth of a metre in gold, do you think? I've seen calculations, I don't I haven't had a chance to check them myself, but I've seen calculations say the total amount of gold on the planet, on the on the 
crust of the planet would fit in two swimming pools. Okay, so it's less than you think. Um, so they see the interest rate being too flexible because of the nature of banking, and that flexibility meaning rates are often too high or too low. When they're too low, it sets off a boom, and the boom will mean malinvestments occur, and those malinvestments must fail, and therefore you have a boom followed by a slump. So they're critical of um, a crisis occurring, and they blame the financial system for doing it, and they blame fractional reserve banking in the case. So the intriguing thing is that Hayek does seem to be aware that banks can create money, okay? but he doesn't see when you create money, you also create debt. So there's no consideration of debt in his logic. He thinks about money being too much money, too little money, and therefore causing cycles, but he doesn't worry about too much debt. So I think Schumpeter, again, is better than most of his Austrian followers because he sees cycles as coming out of this process of technological change. So you have a, a new invention like the, you know, the rockets for intercontinental travel. They come along and they cause a boom when they first occur and then a slump when they're actually when they're first being built, a slump when they come into operation. So now that Musk has said that that's feasible to use rockets, what do you think other people are making rockets are thinking right now? Is this feasible too? Can we do it? Okay. Could we do the same thing? So you've got companies like Amazon. Jeff Bezos has a company, uh, I've forgotten the name, I think it's called Blue Sky. And um, what's his name? The guy who runs Virgin, Richard Branson. He's also working on a rocket company. So um, he's saying one person having that idea means other people are going to try to copy it. And therefore, a single idea can lead to an explosion of ideas at one time. So you, if it was just a random spread of ideas through time, then there'd be all these little shocks occurring. Okay, You wouldn't get any clumping. But Schumpeter argues that new combinations, as he calls them, new ideas, come about at the same time. So you've all seen the dot-com, explosion of dot-com technologies. It all predates most of you. Okay what they call the dot-com bubble began in the mid-90s. But all the, um, you know, what you take for granted, Amazon, for example, began in the 90s. Google began in the early 2000s. So all these technologies came along at the same time. So search engines were first invented by a company called Yahoo. Has anybody used Yahoo for search? Okay. That used to be the only way to search on the internet. Then, you, then Google came along. Um, several others at the same time. So one person developing a new idea means other people can develop a similar idea and compete at the same time. So he said these changes aren't smoothly distributed. They tend to be clumped together to begin with. And then if that didn't happen, you wouldn't necessarily get cycles because might, one issue might be going up, another might be going down. The aggregate effect cancels them out. What Schumpeter is saying is here, one industry will expand and its expansion will cause all other industries to expand as well. So he starts off by saying um, new, new ideas come from new companies. Credits given to new entrepreneurs, that additional money expands demand in the economy. Okay. So that gives you a general boom. The extra money that being uh, used to build Elon Musk's new rocket, the BFR, I think you know what the middle initial stands for, <coughs> big F rocket, Okay, um, that means that people who are designing that go out and buy sushi or pizza, etc., etc. The boom washes over beyond where it actually starts. So you get an innovation financed by credit, with prosperity coming from the credit, uh, means that other entrepreneurs can also get finance, and the new ideas get financed possibly beyond what's sustainable some of the companies are going to fail. Um, so you get funding for everybody, and you get what's called a positive feedback. Now, positive doesn't mean good. Okay? Positive means it amplifies something else. So the new idea coming along amplifies the possibility for the same or related ideas to also get funding, and you get a takeoff and a boom. But that's going to be unsustainable. If you've been in a rock concert and the noise has gone 
really high frequency and like you, if you're hearing a, a rock band performing and the, suddenly there's, the noise goes through the roof, that's a positive feedback cycle because the noise coming out of the amplifier, being picked up by the microphone, <coughs> amplified by the speaker, coming back at the microphone, that's a positive feedback. loop. It always stops, doesn't it? It gets unbearable and it breaks down. So a positive feedback loop will always break down. So you have success, you have spillovers. Um, and if you think about conventional economic thinking, the neoclassical way of thinking, that's always using negative feedbacks. And negative doesn't mean bad here. It means that something dampens something else. So you all have, you, you all, I don't know how many of you own cars, but I imagine a few of you own cars. When you go over a bump, your shock absorbers are reducing the shock you feel. Okay? The bump hits, most of the shock is absorbed by the shock absorber. You want to get a tiny bump in the car, in the car or the motorbike. Okay? But if you ride a bike that doesn't have any shock absorbers and hit that bump, okay, so th that's a negative feedback. And that's what neoclassicals normally talk about. If you increase price, demand will fall. That's a negative feedback. Uh, they think new, new profit coming in encourages new adventures and that'll reduce profit. But what we see in the normal world is normally positive feedbacks. And that's what the mainstream neoclassicals don't handle as well. So if you have a new entrepreneur coming in has new purchasing power, that's going to drive up the price of all commodities. But then at a later stage, when the new products come out, they undercut existing com commodities. So you get a boom followed by a slump. So at the beginning of the boom, the prices get driven up for existing enterprises. That might reduce their profits when it happens. Um, but then you get You've got an extra demand from the new entrepreneur building new factories, building new products. Then, and that can cause demand to boost boom in the rest of the economy, but then those products turn up. They're going to wipe out the profitability of many other industries. So when you get, when the product comes online, it can cause a slump. So the entrepreneurs pay off their debts, they come out ahead, but when the new products come out, they can actually cause a slump. So Schumpeter... The, Aust the Austrians in general think their cycles are too big in capitalism and they blame the central bank for causing them by producing too much money or setting the interest rate too low. Schumpeter is saying cycles are a necessary part of capitalism. The cycles are caused by new innovations coming along. So that's a good part about capitalism to have the cycles in the first place. So the boom leads to a crisis he calls it a depression. That was the term he used to use for recessions when he was writing. And he says, therefore, the depression plays a natural role because in the slump, when the new products come out, that's getting rid of an old technology which is now obsolete. So if you imagine that rocket, Musk's rocket technology working, then the airline industry is going to be, go from being a global industry to a niche industry because you're no longer going to use... Um, rocket uh, jets to fly from one continent to another, you might instead use aeroplanes or high-speed rail to go from one place to another that are nearby. So I can't see a rocket replacing uh, trips between London and Paris, for example. There's no point to that. So what's a huge industry at the moment, the airline industry, would contract to an industry that just supplied hops, which currently can be done in you know, one or two hours where there's no real-time advantage for a rocket and where the trajectory doesn't help. So that's going to cause a slump in that industry, and that would feed through the rest of the economy. So Schumpeter sees a, a slump as a necessary consequence of the boom that preceded it. Uh, with the fall in demand, you're not, for the means of production, you're not trying to hire workers anymore or buy, build machine, buy machinery to build new factories. You've already done that. So that particular piece of demand has disappeared, so employment's going to fall, and you're also going to be undercutting these other industries. So Boeing's going to start making a loss, Airbus makes a loss, British Airways starts making a loss, so they've got to cut back. So you then get a slump. But while that happens, while the slump's happening, this new technology becomes dominant. And if you look at what happened with telecommunications and dot-com, the same sort of thing applied there too. Okay? So it's a technological and monetary explanation for cycles. 
and you might actually go below equilibrium. You don't just go back to equilibrium again, you go below where you were beforehand. And the actual nature of that equilibrium changes as well because you've got a whole new technology that's involved. You can't really compare the old one to the previous one. For example, could you imagine the world without the internet today? Okay, it's become pervasive. Um, so what, um, and I like this particular phrase a good deal because what Ed Neal talks about, he describes what happens in capitalism as not just growth, but transformational growth. So as well as the economy expanding in size, you're also changing the nature of production quite dramatically. Has anybody seen the, the, the latest, it's a, it's a couple of years older, but the latest Terminator movie? Where Arnie, yeah, okay, where the, where the, where the guy comes back, what's his, his name, uh, Jerem, I can't think of the, John, John Connor, yeah, okay, John Connor's um, father comes back through time to find that whatever name's already fighting on the resistance, okay, and they then come forward to about 2016 and they see mobile phones and everybody's addicted to mobile phones. The world is completely different, okay, without that technology. So that's transformational. The technology has transformed the nature of behaviour. It isn't just an increase in GDP, it's a change in the nature of the economy. So the Austrians, as I said, they they tend to blame uh, the government for causing cycles, and they, I better, I'm running out of time here, I'm afraid there's so many slides I had to go. A few. Um, so let's see, okay. So the final bit he talks about, I've got to stop now because the lecture is going to come in in a short while. The final part of the slides, I'll put them up on, on canvas when I get back to my office. But the basic part here is what Austrians say about economic policy. And generally they're opposed to the government trying to do anything because they say the government's like trying to be an omniscient individual who knows how to move a complex system and they'll get it wrong. So their argument is really to get the government out of the way. Okay, sorry to run out of a bit of time there. Um, but... If you want to get in touch with groups and tell me which, which weeks you'd like, let me know. If you don't do it by the end of this week, I'll be allocating groups to particular weeks. Okay? That's going to be the way.